in the United States, looking at how compassion, reintroducing compassion to shift the culture so we can make the change that we need to make in time. Hello, my name is Lamana Kashif. I'm from Istanbul, actually. This is my hometown, it's my first time being in this my hometown as well. I'm an industrial designer. I um, actually, when I started my career, my you know design journey, I was a bit, um, let's say, like upset when people, you know, I mean, when you say design, they, I mean, say it like, so, I mean, so you do things that people, you know, buy or like just treat people to, to buy things, and that was not why I got into it. That was, you know, basically to, to change the world because you know, that's what we all do. And um, so I tried to um, do this, I mean, job as um, ideas for today and dreams for tomorrow. So I combine um, let's say ideas for today with real products from glassware to you know, like electronics to more like conceptual products, which like envisions the future of, I mean, the world, which is like five, 10 years. I had some time with Fiat Concept Lab um, where we were designing the, the future of the, um, the cities and everything. I had some experience with uh, Nokia. I, I did uh, some concept mobile uh, devices, which was, you know, like I say, it's a balance of um, um, creating, um, let's say, inspiration for the future and bringing things to the real life. And going back to Gaziantep, going back to my roots, actually, my surname is uh, Nakushi, which comes from Nakash, which is the ceiling, um, I say, ornaments from like a wood. And when you think about those things, they're like decorative things right on the ceiling. And actually, I came across to this article which says the, the purpose of those things is actually for the owner of the house, that you just come to the house, and it's just imagine a few years ago, no technology, no television. You just lay down, and you just look at those patterns, and you lose yourself, and you just, you know, it, it just helps you. And for me, those kind of things are really futuristic, as, you know, because right now all the scenes are empty, and we, most of the people fall asleep watching YouTube or television and all these technologies pushing us to this direction. So I believe that there's so much we can take from the past and apply to the future. Thank you. Yes, my name is Panta uh, Omaridi. I'm a journalist with over 15 years of experience in the newsroom and broadcast media. I shifted from a low background to journalism because of my passion that has always been actually to grow and contribute to the betterment of humanity and building bridges, uh, connecting us to each other and to ourselves and helping each other to, to actually connecting to this earth. In 2022, I went through a life-changing uh, personal and career hardship that led me to take a step back and reflect on my work. I felt that the goal of achieving peace and harmony for all humanity seems actually more unattainable than ever before. And that was when I realized that I have to step back and that was, that was what was eating me up inside. I, I decided to change, to change something. And in the past year and a half, I've been working on starting a new conversation about how we can change and educate the masses to media using a positive approach. How can we adapt the media narrative to focus on hope, resilience, transformation, and possibility for the personal and for the common good? So that's why I'm here. I'm here to join hands and uh, for a new global media actually narrative that can help us to harmonize our needs and our planetary needs. Perfect, thank you. I can ask you, Kadir, spend just two minutes because I want to jump straight into these important questions that I can ask. My name is Kadir. Uh, I'm originally from Turkey, but I live in Dubai for 15 years now. <clears throat> and, and I run a capital called Sustainable Impact. It's an impact capital where we invest in. Uh, Startups, which is committing to world's common uh, problems uh, that is still solved, which is called like sustainable development goals. So um, I very much believe um, um, in the topic that we are going to discuss today. Um, 
the role of uh, looking to business or entrepreneurship plays a big role. Like, so indeed, if we, if we can shift looking uh, looking at the entrepreneurship, we can change a lot of things because uh, in many cases, a um, lot of lot of businesses are you know growing, growing, growing, and then they making philanthropy to to uh, somehow look good or changing uh, how they um, how they uh, demonstrate it. So I believe if we do the things rightly from the beginning, from thinking well, we don't have to correct the things, we don't have to break the hearts, you know, and, and, and we can we can um, create this um, symphony at the first place. So I believe we have to think, and uh, that's what we're trying to do uh, at our uh, at our cabinet. Perfect. And Sarah, I'm going to challenge you and the right hand again to put 90 seconds. Oh, I, know, I know that you're So my name is Zara Ahmed Ali Wizir Halali, which is wonderfully coined by my friend Alex here that I'm a walking dichotomy. I'm born and raised in Dubai, um, but I'm of Chinese heritage, and I'm, I basically grew up being the perfect Chinese um, doll or the a, a machine in terms of waking up at 5.30, playing the piano for two hours, achieving straight A star grades, and I never questioned. The road works because the government made it. Everything works. I did as I was told. Um, I went to university, studied mathematics. I did an MBA. I went and worked in consulting because where else do smart people work? Um, and I think I started to challenge everything as I looked around me and I thought there must be more than this. Um, fast forward, I mean, through multiple paths of searching, um, be it looking for effect through effects altruism. I'm not sure if people have heard of that concept, but um, as a mathematician, I was kind of pressured by the effect altruis uh, altruism team to look into AI. But I thought to myself, you know, a lot of, <laughs> yeah, looking into the risks of managing AI, but um, my heart was telling me to go into climate change. Um, I worked. Uh, primarily uh, in corporate um, in Dubai, working with the largest real estate developer doing their CSR um, scheme and implementation, uh, growing into then do I have time? Um, two seconds. I'll just I'll just wrap up. So uh, and then I worked in government, um, the Dubai government, where I launched um, citywide campaigns minimizing the use of single-use plastic bottles, and I said even that wasn't enough, and so. Currently, career-wise, I work for COP28, which is a uh, large meeting of um, the world, I guess, and we discuss uh, climate change policy, and I still don't think that's enough. Um, and what I think is more important is that climate change is the symptom. It is not uh, the problem. And what we need to do is focus on deep, um, deep change on a personal level and so, I mean, we can take this offline, but having gone through multiple nodes of ways of uh, exploration, be it Vipassana, plant medicine, practicing yoga since I was 16, deep meditation, I think, and we'll dive into this later, I think this is actually the most profound path uh, and the most effective path that I've found to apply into my everyday life. Okay, sorry, that's longer. And so, Alex, I you are. You I, got got you. I know you got <laughs> <laughs> My name is Alex Rodriguez. I come from Spain. I am a theoretical physicist and used to be an aerospace engineer. Seems like a few people here had a bit of a hero's journey, it sounds like. Uh, my journey was realizing that the best thing that I thought I could do for planet Earth was helping us escape it. Um, and then I, and I realized that that really wasn't the way and that we're spending way too much time and money. So then I had my own journey and realized that we had to look inwards, our bodies, our minds, but also the earth. So I've spent the rest of my life trying to do, putting as much effort into what people try to put into space, into our own planet, healing our planet, helping us not distinguish ourselves as a human race. Time. Wow. All right, you are. <laughs> what are your limits? Wow, how to follow that. So my name is Luis Levan Sozja. I am an independent uh, filmmaker of British and Turkish uh, heritage. Um, and uh, really my journey started three years ago when I was, a, um, I was leaving a corporate job in the middle of the pandemic. I, I had very basic video skills and I 
Um, I bought a future, a future cast and set up a company called Gesmec Films, Freddy Turks in their room. Gesmec means to wander. I started wandering the world three years ago, wondering what would happen. And um, along the journey, I, um, I suppose I had a number of spiritual or conscious awakenings that um, uh, coupled with my upbringing, being a millennial um, kid with you know eco anxiety, I, uh, I realised that actually my path was uh, to tell stories to hopefully impact a, a better future. And so um, I'm three years into that journey now, and um, in, a, in a number of productions right now, um, anything to do with climate change, social issues, spirituality, all those good things. And um, I would say I'm a regenerative storyteller. That's kind of how I see myself now. Uh, regenerative in philosophy. Um, I hope that my stories will, will create impact and, and generate um, uh, most needed attention on our global issues that we face today. So thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. So I will forego. I, um, I'm most interested to get into the, um, the topic that we're here to discuss uh, today. Um, so I'm going to kick off with Jennifer, and you know we're at an interesting time. we there's a lot of ecological destruction going on. There's a lot of good things going on, and then we also are having a lot of rise in human suffering. If you look at the stats and just the feeling of depression, loneliness, obesity. Uh, it's, it's just getting worse and worse, how many chronic diseases are by lifestyle. So, how do you, I'll ask you to start off with, and I'm going to ask you to time yourself this time, and each of the guests, otherwise you will be beeped off. Um, and I may be British, but I will politely, but you will be asked to. Uh, so we can move on, because um, they're, they're important questions. So first is, how are the two trends related? They are intimately related. We are suffering from a threefold illness. It's spiritual, it's psychological, and it's physical. And my colleague here mentioned an orchestra. And in this room, we have an orchestra of people who have all sorts of different instruments to play. Finance, change makers, filmmakers, storytellers, media, business, venture capital. We have this extraordinary <coughs> orchestra. And we have been given an orchestra in the world, but it has been playing to the wrong song sheet. It has been playing to a song of unsustainable growth and unbridled greed. And it's really not that long that that has been the case. It's really only since, well, obviously it started in 61, but 79 and, and 81, 79 in the UK, 81 in the United States, that this creed became the song that governed how we live. So we need to make a shift, a really, really urgent shift. And the consequences of neoliberalism, of unbridled, unsustainable growth, we can see it all around us. We can see it in the levels of mental Ill health. We can see it in the fact that we have hundreds and millions of people starving, whilst at the same time in the global north, we have people struggling with obesity. We have hundreds of millions dying without surgery whose lives could be saved. Well, we have people, again, largely in the global north, spending millions and millions of pounds on plastic surgery. The biggest form of plastic surgery, demand for a new form of plastic surgery in America is labiaplasty. People are spending money <laughs> changing the shape of their genitals while other people are dying. It is absolutely insane and we all know it's insane yet we don't know what to do about it except we do the values we live with at the home are not reflected in the way that we live as a society in the home we practice love we practice compassion we don't throw our grandmother out when she ceases to be an economic value we don't dissipate what we have without concern for the next generation and yet when we leave our front doors, a different culture is in place. And it isn't that we have drifted away from politics, it's that politics and leadership has drifted away from those core values. And what has resulted is, is really all of us being captured by fear. 
And when we're fearful, we're not able to enter that iterative, generative space where we're able to connect. Everything becomes a threat. And in the absence of, I'm just trying to check my time, in the absence of, of what we really need, which is belonging, connection, mirroring, a sense of agency, a sense of hope for the future, we are fed a diet of fear and we reach for material things to, to fill that psychological and spiritual void. So we need to have a shift from an economy that measures GDP to one that measures well-being, and we need to use every lever powerful and every instrument in this room to start playing a different song. Perfect, thank you. And we're at the end of time, we love. I'm gonna ask Lewis, to, do you have anything to add to that, or do you want to end the next question? Uh, no, I think, um uh, spiritual void is the key, I think, here. Yeah. Um, I think um, the, the very question itself of are the two trends linked to sort of geological uh, downfall and our own sort of like uh, psychological and sociological uh, downfall, the very, asking that very question just shows that we, we're lacking a very collective conscious awareness, like a, like a conscious awareness of who we are um, and from where we come and and what part we play within the wider ecosystem. So I think spiritual void is, is the key there. Um, we have essentially built um, civilization upon civilization and forgot the very essence, I believe, from which we come. And of course, asking that question then raises, uh, raises another question. What do we do about it? Well, we can't go back. <laughs> we can't go back. We're living in a machine now that's been running for uh, maybe 5,000, 5, 6,000 years and has reached a, um, a pinnacle, I believe. And, um, and, and that sounds quite terrifying. In fact, it is very terrifying, and, and, and all of us are terrified because we don't know, really know what to do about it. We've come to the crescendo, um, we found ourselves at this point, and, we're, um, and we have everything, essentially, we need from what we can see. Um, yet, there is still something missing. There is that void there. Um, and so, and so I think this is really a, a, a question of reconnection, of reconnecting back to um, the essence of who we are as a, um, as a sentient beings within this ecosystem. Um, and how to do that is the, is, is, the, is the million dollar question. Perhaps it's the eight billion dollar question, eight, eight billion people question we have right now on, on the planet, which is to how to find reconnection um, how to come back to um, uh, harmony with uh, ourselves and, uh, and, the, and the ecosystem around us. So spiritual void is, is the key thing there, I think. Jennifer, to you, I think you just said that you'd like to answer that. No, I, I just think you've nailed it, but there is also an answer. There is an answer. So whether you want to call it connection or compassion, we know that connection is the single biggest influencer of medical outcomes of physical and mental health. It costs nothing, it's available within all of us, but because it isn't a product, it isn't marketed, it isn't sold, and very rarely is it prescribed. It can be taught, it can be inculcated, it can be facilitated and encouraged, and there are 600 communities already across the globe that are practicing this. So we need to take the wheel that exists and expand that more. And I'll just give you one example. A small community in the UK decided to create a connected community. Their death rate dropped by 20%. So it's there. We have it. We just need to sell it to the world. Can I just add that on top of that? Just one second. Very short. Very short. Um, and then just to caveat that, because it just sound, sounded, uh, I absolutely agree, and it sounded quite um, uh, dystopian, well, what do we do, how do we find reconnection? The, the hope that I do have is that actually, this is probably the only point we've ever been able to actually acknowledge, the fact that we're, we're, we, we are uh, in connection with the, with the wider world and, and that um, we are part of Gaia or, or uh, the ecosystem of the world. We've, we've come to this point of intelligence um, yes, but actually it's the first time we're smart enough to actually acknowledge and be conscious of ourselves and the impact that we have. Like we've created essentially a, a planetary consciousness with our ability to understand how the planet actually works and operates. Right? We know how one thing uh, that, that happens on the, on the south of the planet affects the, the north of the planet and vice versa. 
So we are at the first point in time, this is where I get hopeful instead of really miserable, is the first point in time we're actually aware of our situation. I think now we're actually entering a, a geological epoch, which is the Anthropocene, right? So the Anthropocene meaning that we are, as humans, the primary drivers of uh, planetary uh, stability. And that's, uh, that's absolutely terrifying, but at least we acknowledge it now, and that's, I think that's the first step to a collective consciousness. Okay, thank you. And I'll just add to that, um, Tim Lenton of the Tipping Points Institute at Exeter University um, is voted in one of the top 100 climate scientists, and he maps out positive and negative tipping points, and he's unable to join today, but he has sent me these notes, and I think he sums it up rather well, at a deeper level, the same drivers that are causing ecological destruction are driving inequality, overconsumption, and related depression and ill health. We are trapped in an economic growth at all cost mentality, which is causing profound human cost alongside ecological destruction. So we just started some work about how actually the financial models uh, that he's doing with the uh, Bank of England and the UK actually feeds in um, these um, human factors as well. Um, to the audience, I'm going to mix things up and ask you to think about some questions because I don't want to have it that it's rushed at the end. So I may mix things up. We prepared some questions, but um, after particularly this question, we will um, we'll open it up to yourselves and then we'll come back. Um, in some. So really short this time on the responses of can mankind and the planet live in harmony? And I'm going to ask uh, Tamar to um, start us off. I can just ask you to time it on there. That would be great. And then I'll come to you. Sir. Good luck. Well, and like I said, um, to look at the future with optimism is the main key for a designer. I'm, I would say you can't get like, you know, have a you know that kind of I mean outlook I mean on the other side. Um, so um, to to to think about a future where we I mean actually I mean I have this idea that if we have this like a utopian idea of a future in our minds I mean as a designer as what we do I mean then everything that we do every project is a step towards it. But if we don't have it, we just like like solve things, but it doesn't solve anything. So. It's really important to have this vision of the future, like 50 years from now, or like, like whatever. But once we have that, where we want to go, I think everything starts to move more like fluently. And like I said, um, I'm just trying to, I mean, in my work, try to, to break norms and this technology and like like futurism in that sense doesn't have to involve like electronic devices or everything. It can come from a hat or it can come from like something else. But everything can be questioned. Everything can be re rethought. And I think we, I mean, as this generation, we're at a really critical point because we are the last ones who no knew before the technology came in and took everything else. I mean, let's say because all the depression, everything, and just like this connectivity is is is caused because of that. And I mean, you just know, like, to to have a pen friend, you know, before or to have a connection that was not based on a profile that you just look at the pictures and you just assume that this person is this kind of person. So as much as this connects us, it really, like, it doesn't connect us at all. It just is going to a very dangerous point. So I think we should be looking for new ways to, to connect with each other and connect these ideas in some ways. Okay. And then, Kadir, if I ask you, and then I'm going to really ask the audience for a question. I believe uh, we, we, we don't think enough uh, of others, you know. But when humankind is, is, um, is OK within himself, um, they start not caring about others. I think it's very important in a harmony. Um, it's very important to uh, look at the other parties. I mean, if if if you if you if you're not observing the other parties, uh, there will be no harmony. And um, I believe um, the shift should start in the politics in the government sector. Because like they are the one who hold the treasure of the of the country, and they have to make this political, uh, social agendas. So if if if because they are the main main source of uh, um, you know the the running the big audiences like the public, and then uh, they have to uh, teach the people the the actual value add. 
is not only the economic economic return, but also the the uh, a happy society. So, um, um, and if we if we really think, you know, like when we starting something, ask every like if we ask the mind, our minds, what would have society think of what I'm doing? What, how would this affect to the people? Not fir first approach is always, I believe, wrong approach. You know, the, it, because it will lead us to economical returns. But we have to think, wh how would people think about it, and how would how this would help people when you, you know, when you, for example, you starting a, a venture. How, how how would this help people? Because eventually, when you when you solving the people's problem, indeed you are creating a big economic um, return as well, you know. But the first question should always be: um, Does this really help the society? Not what what would what should be the the return of the project, you know? Okay, so now I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have a burning question from what they have asked of gentlemen in the back? And then we're going to go to the ladies, and we're going to do two questions. Yeah, um, thanks for this. Uh, it really interesting. Sorry, I didn't catch the name of the person that you quoted, but um, fascinating insight. It's all right, it's all right, I don't need to see. Um, uh, my question is this effectively, to create connection, we're talking about continuous personal growth. We need to grow as humans, we need to connect with one another, we need to learn, we need to exchange. That's why meetings like this are so important. Yet, uh, the paradox is that to achieve what um, you referenced in the quote, which is this pernicious pursuit of eternal growth, which is respectfully to the gentleman who's, who's just spoken, I have to disagree, I don't think it's in the hands of governments because they can't they can't come up with decisions about we must reduce GDP or we must stagnate GDP. They just won't do it because they won't get re-elected. Um, but for private corporations and, and those that are publicly listed, how do they wrestle um, the, the equation of potential degrowth with the equation for eternal human personal growth with the other equation in a high inflation market, which is that if you basically ask humans to take less, they're the ones that suffer not the companies when they say let's reduce your net wage um, it's always the humans that suffer so you have a you have a perfectly vicious cycle of trying to get humans to connect more and grow more but then you're saying take less consume less and you are then affecting their psyche because then they become miserable because they're like well I've got less money to spend at the every at the end of every month fantastic thank you does anybody want to start with that and pick up quick fire just very quickly, the, the, the driver of overconsumption is an absence of the things that we really need as humans. So at the moment, there's, you know, we're starving, and then the candy floss of extremism is on offer, which tells us we're somebody, we're going to belong, we're going to be great again, and so we reach for the candy floss. So the answer is that connection provides what we really need, and that is a zero cost option. And when we're connected, when we're in balance, we don't need to fill that void with things. But at the same time, we need a basic income and we need to ensure that there is enough of the basics for every single human on this planet. And that is relatively easily done when there's the will. Anybody else wish to invest in I just uh, tried to mention, I mean, of course, it, it's not all in the government's hands, but they have a role. They have a big role. You know, uh, I, I, of course, it, it, it, there should be a private sector shift, uh, but the government has a role to, to lead this shift. Of course, uh, at the end of the day, the privates uh, will, do, uh, will do the change. I, I highly recommend looking at uh, tipping points um, from Tim uh, Linton, was the name uh, that I referenced before. And it may provide some insights there because it looks at both positive and negative tipping points. And not just, the, oh, here's some drivers, but actually what will get them over the critical, will it be like a pendulum and come back again? And that is 
I find it very personally interesting um, because it brings in the financial markets, it brings in governance. Um, I can quote a little bit more of what he says, is can mankind and planet live in harmony? Only if the politically dominant worldview and associated economic exchange, we need to change the values that are driving society and give a political voice to our life support system. So it does appreciate the value or the influence of the political system, but also recognizes that no one party is going to change it. Um, and I'm happy to extend that your question to him, because I know uh, that he'll have a, uh, a very good response. Um, it's something that he's reflecting upon greatly at the moment. So the lady, um, would that ask your question? Thank you. My name is Rihanna. I'm from Slovenia. Actually, I want to... You, you stole a little bit of my question. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. No, it's, the, the fact is that governments compete uh, among each other in growth. So every government that doesn't grow is, is not going to be uh, uh, re-elected. But are we, as human beings, um, there is a certain threshold of safety and security that everyone needs, but are we willing to uh, give up to buy 100 clothes and uh, like 10 clothes instead of 100? And on personal level, um, are we willing to give those things up and maybe invest in those countries that still need growth? In the, in the north, we actually we have enough for most of people to, to, to live really nicely. But are we as human beings willing to invest this surplus that we don't need, that we would spend for another 10 or 20 clothes to invest into, uh, into underdeveloped countries which still need growth? And um, th that is actually my question. Are we, are we capable of doing that? And what, what does it take to, to achieve that state? I think if we had the answers to all of these questions, we wouldn't be here, and it wouldn't be little old me answering this. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, it's really clear that fundamentally what we need to do is change our incentive model. And I'm not a financial expert in any means, but is it changing the way in which um, our, econo our economic models are driven? And it is easy for us to say, yes, we will give away all of our surplus. Yes, I am willing to not purchase anything further and give um, all the money um, to X charity, to X person. It's a really difficult um, personal decision to make, and it's not something that we can impose. But I think if we have some ideas of looking into pressure models and looking into newer systems, I don't have the, um, the answers to this. Um, something that I've been playing with is it maybe looking into Bitcoin, for example, as a, as a currency, where we are looking into um, a currency which has no impact on inflation, it's not centrally um, controlled. Will this introduce a new way of being? Can we barter? Can we look into smaller, how can we decentralize and give more power to people to grow their produce locally? And how can, I think fundamentally it is this, um, we'll finish off, it is this, uh, this uh, question of understanding yourself and your role to play and um, understanding we're not a machine. We're not machines, we're not here to maximize our output and that the life experience is something richer to be had. And I don't know if I will, I do know, and I think that if we're able to do this on an individual level, then we can take this into our everyday roles in government, private and private firms, etc. Can I just say something really quickly, which is, that, which is that there are a number of, of solutions that exist. They're just not being adopted. The Wellbeing Economy Allowance, five nations have decided to measure well-being rather than GDP. Let's not talk about anti-growth or pro-growth. Let's talk about what we use our economy for. Is it our servant or our master? And we have made it our master, and we need to purpose it to do what we need it to do. There's that. There's things like the Better Business Act, which would change fiduciary duty so that boards would no longer say we have to operate in this way because of our shareholders. There's the eco side. I see someone from the, from the eco side campaign here make ecocide a crime, really simple. These things exist. What we, the public, have to do is incentivize our politicians to do it. There's a wonderful quote from an American activist, Marion Wright Averman. We just need to be fleas against injustice. Enough committed fleas fighting strategically can make even the biggest dog uncomfortable and even the biggest nation change direction. And finally, when there is a war, 
governments change overnight, and we are facing the equivalent of a global war. We are facing the extinction of our planet. And if we can get that simple, the levers will be pulled and the solutions will be enacted. But we're all living in a level of collective denial, which we all have a duty to try and break. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, amazing comments. Uh, I'm just wondering about the role of the media and the fact that most of us now experience switching the screens on and being blasted by fear, which has contributed to the men mental health crisis. And we've got Panther on the panel who I know is trying to revision that and, and share some uh, uplifting news for, for once. So I'll, um, I'll try and just have a, a comment uh, on uh, both parts before we go uh, to yourself. I didn't, um, it's probably because I've worn different hats. I have a very curious mind um, and I have lived in the corporate world, um, in the investor world, in the entrepreneurial world, um, and then also in the mentor and world in some very interesting places of entertainers, sports stars, family offices, politicians, um, for whatever reason, they have said that, well, they just want to share things with me. And <laughs> it's kind of something that I didn't train. But why I'm sharing this is actually, if we could just take a step back and say, look, there isn't right or wrong, we're just all looking at things from a different perspective. And rather than bashing them, is actually just to be, to get really real, what is it that they actually need for this to work. So I was with a government minister last week, and if I just look at this bottle, and this is 100%, he's operating at 20 or 30% right now. So how can we, and he gets hit by media, gets hit by the public, and the whole thing is that the system change, he can't <laughs> operate at any higher. So the best way that I could help and give back is actually, what can we do to get him up to 80 to 90 to 100%? because then we can perform more. But these people that bash and make it bad, there's a particular, again, I was with an um, influential character, um, and influential because he has billions of dollars. And then I said, but you are not. If you didn't have, and I did swear, I won't do it here, Frank, if you didn't have the money, you would not be influential. And then we had, then the real discussion started. Because what we could unearth was he was living from a place of fear, from a place of lack. And this was a billionaire multiple times over. And he is trying to buy his way to have significance. Because there's six human needs, one of them is significance. So when we could break down and do that work with him, but in a safe space where it didn't feel like he was being like taken down, there was something wrong. That's when change happens, and now he wishes to create um, a center for character and values, or whatever the word's going to be, because he goes, and by the end of the session, said actually the single biggest thing missing in this world is leaders with character. And they said, right. So I would invite to actually say what's the most empowering question that we ask ourselves. But now when I hear, and in my corporate life, I mentioned, is yes, I joined National Geographic because that was my passion as a child, as the window to the world. So I ran those, the commercial side in Asia Pacific. And I said this to Rupert's face, when they came in and Fox International bought us, there was a values <coughs> interest in. I have a great deal of respect for Rupert from a business side, and we have many debates. Um, but there is a power to media but I think people are starting to see that now it's not just media, it is the technology that gets us addicted. And so I work with gaming industries of what makes it most sticky. And the technology can actually change the prefrontal cortex. So I think there's ultimately, there will always be exponential technologies. What can we do in the framework we have of exponential consciousness? But we have to get really real. Uh, the politicians are always going to be there, the family offices, the institutions are always going to be there, and we can't say they're wrong. Um, how can we actually get in a circle and work with them? So. Yeah, sustainability cannot indeed uh, be achieved 
if only the most sophisticated and educated in the world contribute to it. We need everyone's contribution. That's why we need to change the mindset as widespread as possible. So far, the discussions about sustainability and connecting to each other and ourselves and personal growth has been confined within the network of privileged and the sophisticated one, or however you want to name it, the educated one. While there are other people that you have to reach out to, and how can we do that? As a person who has worked in the media, I've seen firsthand the power of the media, but are we using, are we leveraging the media as, it, as how we should and could do? We need to educate people. And a lot of people in other panels, I saw that they rightly emphasize on that. And because this is exactly where we are lacking behind and where the media can play a vital role, vital role, um, the media should find new ways of storytelling to make the topics about sustainability, to make topics about um, personal growth engaging to the, to the masses, to everyone. We have to reach out to the most remote, remote places in the world because they are every day revealed to a lot of brutality, to a lot of violence. But do they have access to resources that would elevate their mind, that would shift their mind, that would help them to build a sustainable world? Because when you are all the time reveal to negativity, then you go into a nihilism. You, you, don't, you don't care anymore about sustainability or your planet. So that's how I think you should shift the mind to media. That would be my answer. That's one minute. We were at yes, but I'm not all in. We're just going to have Ben's response soon. Uh, thanks, Martin. I, you know, I, I, I was I was really resonating, Martin, with what you said, and just in general, the, some of these comments. And I wonder if, it, you know, we, as a society, we tend to fetishize things uh, collectively. So sometimes we fetishize military prowess and strength, and sometimes we fetishize, um, uh, you know, uh, personal celebrity. Uh, we fetishize uh, influence. We fetishize materialism. Uh, and uh, sometimes we fetishize, you know, health and, and wellness and, you know, being absorbed. These days we fetishize being victims. Uh, that's a very big uh, strain. Everybody wants to be a victim and uh, somebody's greater victim than somebody else. Um, and I, I wonder if one of the things that is kind of uh, and a, a sad thing that we haven't fetishized in quite a while is the value of fulfillment uh, through work and contribution, right? And, and there were periods of um, national collective unity in various countries that uh, put the value of societal contribution as uh, kind of a paramount. Um, and many of those types of values have kind of withered away over time. Um, and, and I wonder if that's something that, um, so rather than thinking about growth and GDP and things of that as the enemy, it's, it's in many ways it's orthogonal. Um, and maybe, maybe it really needs to be focused on, rather than getting people to be happy and well and you know, focus on me, me, me, me, me, maybe the focus should really be how do we contribute to others. Yeah, and maybe we can replace the word work in your sentiment with service because I think we're in danger of excluding a lot of the people who aren't in the room. You know, indigenous peoples don't need us to educate them about the climate. They know how to protect their land from the climate and it's because we haven't listened to their wisdom that we've arrived in this situation. And similarly, the world of work excludes many people, it excludes carers, it excludes those who don't have the physical ability to work, it excludes the old, it excludes the young. So I think we have to be really careful to keep this conversation inclusive. And so I, I love what you're saying, but I would just 
think that either service or, in my case, I would argue compassion needs to be that value rather than, than work per se. Uh, but just to push back on that, I, I don't think that any of these things are, that those people are not working. They're, there is work. <laughs> it is it is work to be of service. It is a, it is work to uh, to contribute. I don't think that's exclusionary at all. And in fact, um, the elderly, um, we, we as human beings, uh, throughout our entire lives, used to work through old age. The concept of retirement um, is a modern invention and has significant evidence that it's an absolutely toxic, terrible. Uh, plan. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that that's exclusionary. Well, I'll add some uh, points uh, to, to that. There is so there is six research studies that I've come across that actually um, correlates how a person to feel meaning or to feel a purpose that their life has some sort of meaning, and they can get that from work, they can get that from family, um, and they can get it from nature as well. Um, and this was actually a discussion that I was having with Tim over dinner last week. And he actually says, actually, can we reconnect with nature and planet and the birds reconnecting to ourselves? And one thing he nailed, it depends upon your personality. And he took me through the entire um, field types and I had quite a lesson. And some of us reconnect by going into nature, others reconnect um, by going inwards. On your point on purpose, uh, we'll definitely speak afterwards because I'm actually in talks with two governments uh, because the research shows that um, there is now a direct correlation for a person to have a feeling of meaning or a purpose in their life with a direct correlation with the number of nights that, there is a, uh, that you'll spend in hospital and a cost to society and therefore the government. So then I was like, okay, great. So historically, um, I've done it with the Singapore government um, and created a, a edtech uh, company that they fully subsidized and paid 100% for every baby born in Singapore because we were able to show the research. And so we're in the process of actually doing that right now. Um, so I'd love to speak with you afterwards. Um, Sorry, just as another question, yeah. maybe I've missed the point here, but um, to Jennifer's point and your response, um, what, how does this correlate with the largest unpaid uh, sector of the whole economy, which is mothers, right? Or, or, sorry, sorry, I'll take that back, which is unpaid parental care for their children because there's now an increasing number of working uh, fathers or not non-working or part-time working fathers looking after kids but equally there is a huge compassion problem there is a huge challenge in that businesses aren't getting it right they just don't get the return to work right and uh, mental health challenges come out of it and you, you talked about a connection with nature a connection with family but actually for uh, look, I'm never going to be a mother, by the way. Um, for some mothers, um, the return to the normality, to the habitual routine of a workplace is a tonic from a child which they love dearly, but they struggle with. Postnatal depression is a very, very real um, you know, societal problem. So I just wonder, maybe I missed the point, I've misinterpreted, no, no. but what, what Jennifer's is... Jennifer's going to address no, you, that now. you just made the point. That's why we're saying that we shouldn't talk, use the word work, because it excluded all those who don't count as workers. And I think, I think it's Martin answered the question, which is paid work is one part of the equation, but we have to have a purpose, irrespective of whether or not we're working. And we know we're facing a huge industrial revolution with AI, and the way our world is going to change. We cannot build it around an outdated model which was really built around male units of labour that are designed to create and generate wealth for those who own capital. We have to reimagine how we create, how we function, how we create the wealth that we need to make sure that no one starves and how we distribute it. And you're absolutely right. And I really thank you as a man for making um, that point. Thank you. Do you have anything to add on? Anybody else on before we go on to the next question? Well, I believe, um, like, I would like to come to a point from my uh, um, friend uh, 
uh, discussion in the early years, yes, we got uh, an urge, maybe um, 5,000, 6,000 years old, that uh, really needs to hard to recover. But I think humankind is created in a nature of recovery. You know, like I'm sure if we, all, all, of, all of people in this room, um, live with a mission, you know, just uh, in himself to, um, um, with a mandate to, I will live this life meaningfully. And whatever, whatever in, in, in whatever is the belief, I think, I believe, I believe humankind, like the sufferings are increasing, that's because humankind is taken away from its values. And, and I believe we have to have more room, like we, like as much as we go to capitalism, we have to, we have to also maintain ourselves and our, our living um, uh, purpose, you know, we have to connect to our purpose and, and, and we have to question the life, I mean, and uh, we have to question everything we do, but today's economics, it's just running us, makes us don't think, you know, just do and make more tomorrow, more and more. I mean, I think we have to make this shift uh, because this is this is at the end of the day is not taking human forward. You know, like ec economy is not uh, not uh, only um, uh, human surviving things. Like many of us is passing away, even don't touching the economy we created in our, our bank account. So we have to switch what's the meaning for humankind in this life. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to mix things up a little bit, and I'm going to ask the three questions that we um, I'd sent out before, and then we can play a little game on whether you've got better questions than the three questions. Um, and uh, because we've got um, 32 minutes together, very respectful of time, and I really want to, for us to get the most value out of it. Before I do on the government side, the lady before that answered it, is um, I always look at things, last week we had a very real conversation, is we cannot afford to carry on going on the way we can. Um, and I was like, what happens if somebody doesn't care about compassion? I want to make sure that the argument becomes the logical choice for the CFO, nothing, no disrespect to CFOs, <laughs> that actually are only looking at the numbers. So take being nice off the equation, anything to do with it. What is the compelling argument that makes them come to the decision themselves that this is this is the logical choice. And, and in the UK, we had a very conversation around, okay guys, don't care if you want your population to have a healthier, happier life. Tell us how you're going to afford to have more people that are gonna live longer with chronic, more than two chronic diseases by this time, that are gonna um, be stuck on these drugs because when you go to a GP, you only give them uh, nine minutes and your answer is to give them the drug that they're gonna be on average for five years and then the cost of everybody, then you got the benefit system and then you got obesity and all of these costs, oh, by the way, you got baby boomers, so this, this graph's going here. So now there's a listening. So when we are able to present the financial side, it'll go in, we may have got a solution for your problem, then they started listening. And then we just take it through, what's the pain point problem, here's the unique solution, and here's the credibility why listen to us. So we're just simplifying it. So I'm gonna read three questions. No, I just want to say there's an excellent book called Compassionomics, which itemizes the health savings of introducing compassion. Two minutes, a two minute talk with an anaesthetist before anesthetic is administered leads to two days less in hospital. It's simple. The savings are there and it costs next to nothing. So I agree, the economic case is there, we just have to make it. So, here's the three questions. Please come up with better. Are we doing enough to help our societies cope with the up, upcoming um, fundamental changes? Number two, can we reconnect with nature or the planet without first reconnecting to ourselves and each other? 
And the final was what needs to shift and when, what are the shackles holding us back? And then the final point was we're going to wrap up and it's what's not being said. So I invite you to throw out some questions. We've got 30 minutes left. And uh, just want to say it's been an incredible meeting and so many amazing people that I'm sure you can come up with even better questions. So please fire away, but what I am going to ask you to do is to keep your questions to 15 seconds. And I will time because I want to, and then make sure from yourself, Alex, because I'm not heard I'm going to speak now. Please. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw out everything that I thought about before. Um, that was my monologue. And uh, I was just really reflecting, listening to everybody, <clears throat> and some very um, unanswerable questions that were thrown from over there, which were very nice for reflecting on. I think one of the most important things that I heard today um, was what you said about this trillionaire. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself that possibly the most change-worthy, highest leverage impact that could occur is talking to this human being and convincing and more leverage than maybe anything that any of us could do in this room right now. And so I am a person that likes to think really big usually like in thermodynamic levels, right? Um, but it's the first time that I'm thinking to myself that maybe the approach is much more um, specific, you know? Like just listening to you tell this story is making me realize that a lot of the programs and systems and classes and things that I teach fall on empty minds or empty years or simply turn into innovation theater. But maybe 10 hours spent with this man or woman, I don't know uh, what you said, could literally change hundreds of thousands of lives. So I feel like I almost want to drop everything I'm doing and find people like that to be like, it's a much more, you know, specific approach. So I just wanted to share that. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a game show buzzing with you. I've got to start talking a little. Just, just that you know, we're working with 100 politicians in the UK for exactly that reason. And when we work with them one on one, we have created new laws, shifts in agenda, and you're absolutely right. We have so little time and so much suffering that if we can work with those who have their hands on the lever of power to reconnect them with their own authentic values that they have become divorced from, then bingo. So I completely agree. Can I just add to that as well? So I've been having some ideas ruminating and I've been excited to get back on to the microphone. So of course um, uh, that would make a huge impact and perhaps for a short term impact we need the largest um, uh, but most powerful individuals and organizations to mobilize, uh, to harmonize quickly. Uh, but I really think the power is in the masses and in harmonizing human and planet I think the key is culture actually. Because uh, we have everything, we, we, we, we have everything and, and to your question is, are we ready to make sacrifices? I think we are ready. If we were, if we were um, you know, an individual in a house and we were holding on to our uh, beloved wood that we were stocking over for years, we love wood, and that wood caught fire, we would throw that wood out in an instant. We're, we're just not, we're just, we, just don't know, we just don't know that we're ready yet, I think. And uh, it's getting to that crescendo point where um, we, we don't have a choice but to become ready and be aware that we are ready to make sacrifices and the power is in with, within the masses and um, the, the point I want to get to really is um, media here is, is, is the key I think and I'm not just saying that just because I'm a filmmaker but um, the, the current landscape of media is, is pretty much based on fear. Now if we look at the, um, I don't know, the, the Hollywood led media agenda we're salivating over a dystopian future, essentially. We have Mad Max realities and Squid Games as the most popular um, uh, things that people are watching. This is what is getting the hits. It's based on fear. We're essentially prophesizing our own demise, and I'm not sure to what end. Uh, a really interesting thing that I've been a part of um, over the last few years, and me and Benjamin share this uh, common friend um, who has a, a concept, it's like a social experiment, it's called The Up Games. And the Up Games is essentially a social experiment where you put yourself in the future, right? And we did, we, uh, I filmed these stories at a number of events, COP26, Davos, uh, New York Climate Week, and we have global leaders coming together, playing a game where they're in the future. They're in 2030, 
and with all their experience, with hindsight on their side, they say what they did to get us to where we needed to, to go. And it's quite funny how when you're in the future, you don't look back and, and, and, and explain how it all went wrong. You actually look back and reverse engineer how it all went right because of course that's where we want to go. So I think media right now uh, from a, um, a news perspective is, is, is absolutely terrifying. It's desensitizing us to issues. Um, from a, a social media perspective, it's, it's catapulting um, uh, fear, uh, dystopia. And uh, from a film and cinema perspective, I think we could do a much better job at giving people hope and inspiration and tools to actually influence the culture so that we can actually you know, give people a chance to say, hey, we, we, we can do something about it. And there's many ways we can do that, but I won't go into it. But it's a very philosophical, high-level stance I've got there on the media side of things. Okay, so we've got 23 minutes left and we're going to run around with questions and then we will decide collectively the questions we will uh, grab out to. So just fire away your question and then we'll... For me the question is that uh, are we ready to sacrifice is not the right question. I think is how do we create awareness that the sacrifice is an illusion and it is not a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, getting back to the 15 seconds, my question would be if you could have one important conversation with your children which you could reflect on in 30 years time, what would it be? Fantastic question. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Answer, actually. We're going to collect questions first. We're just going to... Uh, any more questions from the audience? Because I'm just with uh, Benjamin. Yeah, maybe uh, when I think of planetary health and um, human health, uh, what about the role of plant medicine? which is now getting a lot of attention uh, in the academic world across Ivy League universities and King's College London, Imperial, uh, and plant, plant medicine. Fantastic, thank you for the question. Any more questions from the audience? When, uh, are, we, are we thinking about solutions that fundamentally run counter to human nature? Sorry, could you Are we thinking or proposing solutions or prescriptions that are fundamentally counter to human nature? Thank you for that question. Can I just respond? I didn't mean uh, giving up things literally, but uh, the option, the other alternative is just to keep on going, with, uh, spending a lot, mm -hmm. and keep on growing, and keep on using natural resources. So my, my point was actually that we need to stop at some point and say, I have enough actually, I don't need so much more. That's what I meant, not, not some topic. Fantastic. Any more questions before we start? Getting the um, this is probably just a quick point. Uh, yes or no. Um, with an 8 billion population, do we need to stop eating meat? A uh, quick uh, statistic. When modern agriculture started 10,000 years ago, livestock animals contributed about 1% of the population, land animals. That's now 95%. Yeah. What's the role of collective imagination? Because we create out of the, um, from the imaginal and the role of imagination in our world today mm. and the collective actually imagining together for that 2030, 2050 vision. Perfect. Thank you very much for the questions. So, you want to start with responding? Yes. Um, actually, sorry. Um, sorry, just before you do, because we've actually taken a lot more questions than we thought we were going to come through, I am definitely going to be making sure it's a 60 second to get across the key points because we will attempt, if everybody's up for it, to fire through the answers. So the key points, if you could do that. So actually, like that, that point of like, do we need a tank close was the question, and actually that's the, I mean, the answer here is like design, you know, like, and what do we change? We change the way we live, but it's not by sacrificing. We find new ways of dressing, you know, in the future we're not going to be dressing in the, these ways. And then, um, so, I mean, if you look from a company perspective, like, to make more products that sells is not also going to be, like, um, profitable. You can make more sustainable products that, I mean, last longer, but you can reach broader audience, you can sell it in more countries if you do good products. So, um, I mean, things that's going to change is not going to be a sacrifice, as you say. Maybe we're going to change dramatically the way we live. We're not going to be having those things. Maybe we're going to be switching parts of the clothes, and that's going to be maybe more popular amongst the new generation. As in the other sense, maybe like with the Starbucks example, you know, with the media or like social media, everybody knows or goes with these plastic cups that doesn't exist 
20 years ago, this like coffee thing, and that is the like that's not a human need, actually. So the importance of design is is very important, and to, to like innovate and to create room for innovation. Um, but those things also just end up in competitions or like some sort of like design idea things, and they don't land in a real so a solutions. And in that thing, I want to tie to the like collective imagination part. I mentioned two, yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in the scenario of like collective imagination, I'm gonna ask this question. I'm gonna have this question. Yeah, you are gonna, the, we're gonna go on for the next one. We're gonna go on Technically, we okay. have to finish this by six, by Frank. So, okay. we have 19 minutes left. So, math, mathematician says 60 seconds, and we could just about get this done. But I'm gonna need the support of everybody because I think we'll have about 30 seconds left. So. Yes. I appreciate that um, some of uh, you have raised uh, the concerns about on the governmental level and uh, also on corporate level. Uh, yes, they are indeed doing the, the, the worst harm and uh, to the sustainability, but eventually it's the collective uh, consciousness that you have to, uh, to, have to, to raise. And I don't see any other solution but to do that through media. Collective consciousness, wisdom, can only be spread through media. Uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's, that's indeed, uh, thank you so much for uh, saying that. No, because the traditional media is in a roller coaster, and they don't have even time, I think, to think about this. So we have to either have a global, new global media, or having organizations to give them input. Because, for example, in the newsroom, everybody who has worked uh, in the newsroom knows that the news bulletin, in the last 30 seconds of the news bulletin, they try to build off a news bulletin by kicker, as it's called, so something lighthearted. But it is, in a one hour news bulletin, 30, 30 seconds of about sustainability, about something nice. But and I'm gonna just make sure that Sarah gets things so everybody has their parts, because mathematically we can <coughs> all, so thank you very much, I will be coming back to you. Sarah. I'm just deeply thinking about making one point, and for me it's re-education. And it's obviously us re-educating ourselves as adults, I guess. Um, and is that through your own spiritual or whatever? Ben mentioned plant medicine, that is maybe one gateway. And if we're able to create a safe um, society, within a new economic framework, a new way of living, like challenging current ways of living, is it necessarily a new play family, etc. I'm just throwing ideas here, we can discuss offline. But then we educating our children, and I think if we can enter the state of not necessarily maximizing GDP, maximizing our pockets, we can look for more collective and tribal ways of living, and perhaps this is the answer, maybe. Six Thank seven. you very much. Perfect timing. Alex, do you have a comments there? If you could just ask the question on the meat question. I want to make sure that that is answered. Just if you just answer that, and then... Yeah, so I mean, modern agriculture began 10,000 years ago. Livestock yep. animals, the big four, plus humans only con contributed 1% of the land animal population. That's now 95%, so yep. it's completely unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to at least reduce our meat eating intake, or at least, or potentially go away from the question. Yeah. Perfect, thank you very much. Lewis is standing with his hands up, so. So, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, um, I, I come from a Turkish uh, background. My grandfather, back back in his day, um, you know, um, there was around, I think, 66% were wildlife um, still out there. Nowadays, out of all the biomass in the world, humans make up about a third. Um, just under two thirds is, is animals we, we raise to eat. And then I think there's around 4%, which is wild, and unfortunately, that's captivity. So it's absolutely terrifying. And uh, to, to your question, absolutely, we need to reduce that. But I think this is just a, a tip of the iceberg of the problem, which is we have a cultural issue uh, where we're disconnected, but we, we're just we're in constant consumption mode, and we don't understand the consequences yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, it's, just a, it's just a fraction of actually um, a, a much larger issue where we're in disconnection with uh, with the ecosystem and the, and, and the balance that exists um, on this planet. So, yeah, it's terrifying. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Alex, do you have anything to add for any of the questions? I don't want to make sure we cover all these. No, I, I, I, um, I have very little to say, but I just thought it was funny. I don't know if I dreamt this or I actually saw this, but there was an ad for, I think I saw it, but there was an ad for me, and it, they were doing just like tobacco that shows disgusting images of people's lungs. 
um, and it was showing disgusting images of the horrible conditions that the animals were being put in that you were eating. I don't, I'm not on one side or another because it's highly polarized and I don't really think there's an answer, but I just thought that was interesting. That's all I have to say. Perfect, thank you. Can you hear me? I believe in a world uh, where one part is uh, suffering with the hunger and the other part is suffering with the overconsumption. Um, so uh, I think it's not about um, have, having or not having, responsibly having. I mean, we, we, I think we, we should very much uh, observe, uh, observe um, the other parties and observe responsibly uh, what, at the first place, you know, um, so. Perfect, just thank you very much. Sure. Very grateful. And um, I want to make sure we address all questions. So which questions have not been addressed yet? Collective imagination and any others that have not been addressed. The parents, the, the, par parents. The, the conversation between a parent and their child, 30 years. Parents and the child, great. Who wishes to start with the parent and the child or the collective path? Apologies in advance if I cut you off, but I am doing my best to get through the questions as best we can. And also Ben's question, which I quite fancy tackling. Psychedelics. No, no, no, no Ben, not Benjamin. Ben's question about are we asking something of humans that they're not capable of? Mm. Beautiful. Start there, please. Um, so within each of us, we have a war, good and evil, self, selfless, greed, self-denial, sloth, industry. And... Um, you know, I believe that the process of evolution is about trying to move from nasty, brutish and short to evolved and conscious. So I, I think that we're capable of it. And you said something earlier, you said, what is the one question? And, you know, for me, the one question we have to ask ourselves is, what matters? And during the pandemic, we were all obliged to ask ourselves that question. And it was simple. What matters is love. What matters is connection. We will risk our lives to help a stranger. That's what matters, and that's who we are as humans. And when we ask that question, we are catapulted back into our true selves. Thank you very much for that. This was addressed in like this morning session as well as your question in a way as well. Um, there's this, of course, collective awakening case we can all sense, right? In some ways, I don't know why is it caused, or cause, but if there's some certain consciousness, you know, is changing. I mean, throughout everybody. Um, but these things only happen in tables like this, you know. Once we like dismantle to our homes, you know, everywhere it just fades out somehow. Or let's say in the collective imagination part. I mean. What if somebody has an answer to this but doesn't have the ability to connect to the other person that has the same idea on some other part of the world? How do we connect those two? How do we work together? Not just us, you know, how, how do we just, you know, use all this technology, all this AI, everything, to somehow formulate these things and get all those people come together, form some groups and, I don't know, like, all, at least to, to feel that we're not alone, you know? Or not losing our minds. <laughs> I think we're not. Um, I think we take much to go in there. Okay. Hey, you, could you ask your question again, just at the end of the table? <laughs> uh, the child. If you could have one conversation with your child, what you, would it be? And you what? are enough. You are loved. That's a very good answer. <laughs> well, I think you're, you're enough already, and you are loved. And to that would be that's it. Um, if I was to expand on it, it would be for him or her to, if I could get over anything, for them to truly know themselves and to have that self awareness and to understand that um, what makes them tick or love on one day doesn't need to be that because there's one thing is yes there's six human needs and we can have awareness <laughs> and you know we can be aware of things you can then make a decision and then take action and then you can do all this thing in the mind to make habits 
And that's great, that can be taught. But there's one, I won't swear, thing that you and every human in here and everywhere in the world will die for. And that is your identity. That is the one thing that is shown. And actually, I need to give credit on the identity side to a gentleman called Tony Robbins, who's now <laughs> having some health issues and is as, having to ask himself some questions of what is actually the most important part and what can he give. And he's doing work at the moment about how can we help people unearth their identity. And because that's the one single thing people will live and literally die for and not question it. And it, anyway, on that and the brain chemistry, it doesn't make a decision of this part of the brain, it's in the prefrontal cortex. And I was like, wow. But ultimately, how can we move people from this fight and flight kind of fear part to then, what I just did say, being themselves and being okay with that. And I think everybody can contribute in society. And to your point about work, I completely agree with you, but also I think in this labeling, where some people feel not enough because they don't excel in this so thing called can work, but boy, do they make incredible mothers, fathers, inspirers. They don't work, but they're incredible storytellers. And that's where people will move. Because I'm like, I, I, when we were at education, I went to the top, we to, and they refused me to bring in the biggest single people that um, move children, McDonald's. They said, oh no, we're better than that. I was like, gee, they, they, the most recognized character in the world is Ronald McDonald. And they created that out of nothing more than Santa, Jesus Christ. And I showed a pie chart, and there's about all the different things that get labeled in life. And traditional education is just this part. And I am very grateful for education, but also there's peers, there's media, there is a family, peers. All of this impacts on what we and feel and do in life. So why can't we look at things holistically? And then factor in, yes, media is important, governance is important, and recognize one that isn't better than the other. So actually then, how do we be in a circle and have those conversations and realize that actually the politicians are human too? I'm meant to report politicians right now, they're the worst looking relationships, known to self-esteem, self-love, but we're not even stop. But, so, but all of them are needed and they play a valuable role. And, and it's this part where today's children will listen more to an entertainer, a sports star, a Victoria's Secret Angel. So when I go to dream school, I have Victoria's Secret Angels in the school. I have the footballers. I have the model because I have reggaeton stars. Because the kids would listen to them and not the teachers. And But we had to use data. I use the data to show we're not listening to the teachers. I can show you they're listening to YouTube and Spotify in the back of the class. So don't tell me they're listening to your teachers. So first get a vision for your life. So. I know I went on that, but it's this, this holistic side. But ultimately, you are love, and you are enough. Is there any other questions? Because we are going to do the final wraparound that I'm going to ask each of you to spend 60 Sorry, seconds. Sorry, this is, this is because when you're loved, you're seen. So if yeah. you're loved, then you have an identity, no? Yeah, uh, absolutely, yes. There's a lot of science, there's academia around it. It's, it's not a, we do things. It's, it's just parts. So I'm very conscious Frank has asked us to finish at six. Um, so I'm going to do a lightning round. And I would just ask you for one kind of summary of key parts of the conversation today that um, you had any parting words or kind of calls to actions. But I'm just going to press this button now that I've worked out. I can cut you off <laughs> if you run over time. The first thing I want to say is that we can do this. Collectively, we can do it. The answers exist. We just have to apply them. The second thing I want to say is about the narrative. You know, we have been running on a narrative of survival of the fittest. But actually, that's a misinterpretation of Darwin. If you read Darwin, what he really said is that it's the survival of the kindest. And when we make that switch from thinking that might is right, 
to actually human connection matters more than anything else, we will be able to turn this ship around. And finally, I want to end on a quote from Maya Angelou. Love costs all we are and will ever be, yet it is only love which sets us free. We have to return to what we know to be true in our hearts, and that is love. Thank you very much. Well, it's always fun to think about all these problems from the, the other perspective, and that I always said this exercise. I mean, if you're I mean, coming from this, I mean, different like planets, and look at this planet, and you see all these solutions, and you, you know, it's because you know everything is, you know, a different, and um, and then I have this correlation because if you look at it that way, the, the kids, I mean, a child is a, you know. Is basically not from this planet. Has got no past. Everything is possible. So instead of trying to find something to tell, I mean, they it just takes one generation to change everything quickly. If they land today, it's just gonna be it. You know, we die and then we just you know live a different reality. So I'm just I'm just gonna end on this saying that you know everything is possible and I think it's gonna come from the new generation. Thank you very much. What I would tell my seven and a half year olds day after day is that he should be kind to himself and to others. Because eventually that is what will raise the collective consciousness and that will be our revelation. Beautiful, thank you very much. Uh, how to wrap up such an amazing conversation, but I think from my point of view, um, media is just the, the key because ultimately it's about culture for me. Um, I, I'm just going to repeat myself. We, we have everything we need. Um, we're, we're the smartest, most capable and connected we've ever been. Everyone knows this. It's culture. So what we need is rapid inspiration. Um, and more than that, um, we need um, stories, and cult stories that promote culture of action. Um, I'm working on a concept of regenerative storytelling, which uh, takes the principles of regeneration in agriculture and applies it to um, the regeneration of mindsets. And actually, through the storytelling process, you can you can create some tangible impact. And um, I think that's that is what is needed there. It's a cultural shift. Perhaps we we we absolutely do need to cut down on our on our meat consumption. There's a number of things that that, that we absolutely need to do. But to do those things. We need that cultural shift. The only worry I have is if we have enough time. Now we're in a poly crisis, which is time bound, and it's a matter of time now. There's a there's an interesting <laughs> yeah talking yeah, time. I just only got one. So there's an interesting climate clock initiative which counts down the number of days we have until essentially the the tipping point. And I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing, but now it's a now it's a now it's a, a matter of time. And uh, can we shift the culture in that time? I think we can because it's. It's the only time we have to do it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. These are not um, I was just, I love what you just said and I was just thinking that I feel like compassion is one of the things that we've lost a little bit in the, in the last, and I don't really know how to teach compassion or how to share compassion except with a narrative. Um, and I would love to hear your ideas, but I do understand that in the real world, capitalism exists. And I would love to hear all your thoughts later on on how to create win-win scenarios where we can kind of accomplish everything we're talking about while still living in the real, actual world of today. So please share those with me. Thank you. Thank you. In my office, I have a countdown timer to call 28. I think there are 38 days left. Um, so I'm going to be welcoming 80,000 people to my city, Dubai. I'm going to be sitting in negotiation rooms for three weeks with 200 parties. I've learned three lessons for Talk, which is upcoming in my life in this session, and things that I'm going to take away. Number one, drop my ego. Number two, go to nature. Number three, love and compassion wins. I think uh, every answer is uh, firstly uh, well, within ourselves, and if we if we make this shift, I believe everyone else uh, will, will will will make others to um, make this change eventually we'll, we'll, we'll, we'll make the change in the world. I would like to finish my words with the, one of the uh, um, greatest poets of all times, Rumi. Be like the sun for grace and mercy. Be like the night to cover others' faults. Be like running water for generosity. 
Be like that for rage and anger. Be like the earth for modesty. Appear as you are or be as you appear. Thank you. And we're only one minute over, so thank you for everybody. <laughs> I'd like to thank each of the panellists and most probably yourself for the wonderful questions. It's a huge topic. We could have carried on for a great time. Everyone. So first of all, I would like to share a few thanks. First of all, thank you to Frank, uh, again, for his Herculean efforts in bringing us all together. Thank you to the city of Gaziantep for a warm welcome and hospitality and delicious food. And thank you to all of you for making such an effort to come here. I counted 50 countries uh, that were coming from, uh, from as far as Uruguay and Korea. So it really shows the commitment you have to this topic and to, to the vision. So I'm Marie T. Calvert, as a coach. And I specialize in working with impact tech founders, helping them and their teams level up as leaders. we need great leadership more than ever. The world is increasingly complex and volatile, and as we're seeing, every week brings new conflict, a new natural disaster. And so this plenary panel has incredibly diverse experience both culturally, as well as across business, government, and academia. So we're going to do our best to highlight the recommendations and initiatives that were discussed and explored over the past two days. That was 50 panels, over 300 panelists, and what it will take for us to create impact with innovation, sustainability, and reconstruction. So we'll just start with a quick round to get a sense of what their takeaways and insights were from the panels that they attended. Uh, but I will do a quick introduction of, of each panel. So, let's start with um, Ali, uh, the Deputy Mayor of Kirkjana. And if you could share some of your insights from the past two days. Evet, öncelikle e, hazırlığına saygıyla selamlıyorum. E, herkese e, katılımlarından ve katkılarından dolayı çok teşekkür ediyorum. Büyükşehir Belediye Başkan Vekili Halil Oğuz ben. E, özellikle iki günle ilgili e, düşüncelerine gelince e, Gaziantep e, yıllardan beri e, sanayi şehri olarak hep anılıyordu. Sanayi şehri olarak konuşuluyordu. E, Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımız Sayın Fatma Şahin'in göreve gelmesiyle e, Gaziantep'in e, kültürel yapısı, kültürel dokusunun öne çıkarılması, yine gastronomiye e, verilen önem 500'den e, fazla e, ürünümüz, yemek çeşidimizin olması, hem Türkiye'de hem UNESCO tarafından gastronomi şehri olmamız, yine kültür yollarımızla e, Gaziantep e, özellikle Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımızdan sonra 2014 yılından beri e, çok farklı başlıklarla e, anılmaya başladı. Ama e, ben buradan huzurlarınızda e, Frank Bey'e çok teşekkür ediyorum. Tüm e, hem Büyükşehir Belediye ekibimize e, iki günden beri bunun geri planı var, mutfağı var. Aylardan beri çalışılan bir süreç. Buraya baktığımızda e, öyle bir noktaya geldi ki iki günden beri Gaziantep'te Horas konuşuluyor. İki günden beri Gaziantep'te ekonomik zirve konuşuluyor. Bugün e, sanayiye gittiğimizde, bugün Gaziantep çarşısını buradaki misafirlerimiz, dışarıdan gelen misafirlerimiz mutlaka fark etmişlerdir. Çarşıda, esnafımızda, vatandaşta herkes orası konuşur hale geldi. E, neredeyse gastronomimizin, neredeyse kültürel etkinliklerimizin, kültürel yolumuzun daha fazla konuşur hale geldi. Bu da bizi mutlu kılıyor, e, bizi gururlandırıyor. Ee, hem Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımızın e, gelecekle ilgili ortaya koymuş olduğu vizyon e, hem de e, Gazi Şehrin e, nasıl bir e, dünya şehri olduğunu e, iki günden beri yapılan etkinlikle ortaya koyduğunu görüyoruz. Zaten panel içerisinde de e, hem panelle ilgili hem deprem sonrası Gazi Şehrin nasıl bir kere daha e, düştüğü yerden ayağa kalktığıyla ilgili süreci istişare edeceğiz diyorum. Ben başka ülkelerden, başka şehirlerden gelen 
e, tüm katılımcılara katkı veren herkese Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanımız Sayın Fatma Şahin adına huzurlarınızda bir kez daha teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Hoş and founder president of the Leadership Energy Consulting Company in Seattle, Washington. And previously he served as Chief Learning Officer at Coca-Cola, Morgan Stanley, helped found the Leadership Academy at Goldman Sachs. So he has this wealth of experience around leadership, is the author of several books on leadership, including a new one coming out uh, called Sustainable Sustainability. So what are some insights and takeaways you've had over the last two days? Thank you. Uh, for me, this last two days has all been about finding profitable solutions to today's challenges like climate change and socioeconomic inequality. Uh, to do that, and what I learned in all these sessions, we need to do five things, and I took some notes. One, we need collaboration, not conflict. Two, we need to believe in interdependence, not self-interest. Three, we need innovation, innovation, and innovation, not business as usual. Four, we need to take a long-term view, not short-termism. And five, we need values-based action to maximize good, not regulation-based behavior to minimize bad. So, thank you. To, to sum up the conference, there are two quotes I picked up from the two sessions that I, from the many sessions that I attended for me, those stood out. One is, uh, in one of the sessions in the plenary, I think it was this morning, it was said that ESG is the moral compass of any company. And then in one of the uh, breakout sessions that I went to, a quote that struck with me was, if technology is created and deployed with good inten intentionality, then the technology will deliver that inten intentionality for the betterment of humanity. So it's not the technology, it's the humans and the intentions in which they create the technology. So with that, uh, my two cents in terms of what I think is the solution, we need to upgrade ESL to e ES, we need to upgrade ESG to ESL, where L stands for leadership. Specifically, steward leadership, where we all think of ourselves as stewards of planet Earth and humanity. What is steward leadership? It is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment. We need to instill these values of steward leadership and the answer lies in revamping our education system from schools, colleges, all the way through to corporations. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. I feel the same. I feel like it's the intentionality was a recurring theme in the panels where technology is not necessarily good or bad, it's how it's used and it's up to us as humans to determine that. Now, Catherine. Uh, Catherine Carlton has diverse experience also across corporate, startups, and government affairs. She's worked at companies like Intel, founded and advised dozens of tech startups, worked with state legislators in California, and for 12 years until the end of 2020, I believe, was the mayor of Menlo Park, uh, California, which is known as the capital of venture capital. Uh, and interestingly, she's currently pursuing a PhD at Vanderbilt on the impact of us. So clearly you're a forever student, forever learning. And what are some insights that you would like to share? I, I did a simple thing. I took notes. And um, I wrote Is that better? Oh, there we go. Um, I, I similarly took notes on what were the, the themes that were coming up again and again. And we talked about AI. And the, the takeaway I, I heard people saying about AI, AI is a tool. Uh, it's not necessarily inherently good or bad. It's like a hammer. I can beat you over the head. I can build you a house. It's something that we have to manage for good or bad. Uh, sustainability uh, reminds me of the quote, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And there's, there's a Maslow's triangle that comes up with sustainability and, and pulling that together. And in doing so, inclusion was one of the big words I heard again and again. And inclusion not only for male, female, people of different eth ethnicities, but young people as well as, as older people. And one of the interesting things I heard today was someone saying, 
hire a young person between the age of maybe 25 and 35 to hack your company's strategy. Because if you don't hire them to help you hack your strategy, they'll be doing it for themselves or for someone else. So bring people in and bring people in that will challenge you. And that generational shift, one of the things that really struck me you know, in, in all the crazy things happening in the world today, I felt it was pretty positive. People are pulling together and working and, and keeping the great and what are we going to do about it kind of attitude. And, and in doing that, I see people here that are entrepreneurs. I see people here that are government, uh, academia, VCs, but they tend to operate in silos. And one of the beautiful things about Croesus is being able to facilitate us working together and communicating uh, better. And in doing that, we talked about compassion, transparency, and trust. And we have to grasp the fact that in today's society, zero sum game doesn't work anymore. Uh, binary, black and white, just doesn't work. It's creative gray. It's working together. It's uh, balance of uh, polar polarities. Uh, someone talked about uh, dynamic tension and embracing that and working together. And um, a lot of that comes through when we talked about uh, the inflation. They raised their hand and said, how many people are critically worried about inflation? And a few people raised their hand. And they said, how many people are worried about geopolitics? A lot of people raised their hand. And absolutely, completely sustainability, uh, the climate crisis is definitely something we need to worry about and factor into our business on a, on a daily basis. However, if there's a nuclear war, we're not going to worry as much about sea level rise. So we need to also make sure that we have the communication going and it really comes down to relationships. That's, that's the key word, I think, for my takeaway from the last two days. That was a great summary. Thank you. And I would um, echo, you're also echoing what Rajiv said about it's not business as usual. Right? We can't just expect to do the same thing without changing the way we do business. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Fahim, let's uh, hear from you. Fahim Hashimi is former Minister for Telecommunication and Information Technology in Afghanistan and one of its leading entrepreneurs. In 2005, he launched what uh, is one of the largest logistics companies in Afghanistan. In 2010, he launched One TV, which became Afghanistan's largest TV network as part of the Hashimi Group, an Afghan conglomerate with interest in fuel logistics, manufacturing, airlines, trading, and construction. What are your, your tech takeaways? Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's such an honor to be here in this beautiful city of Gaziantep, which embodies resilience and courage. And you already see Gaziantep moving after the earthquake. It's also um, great to see Frank and his team orchestrating such a wonderful event where leaders from all walks of life, from politics to business, have come together to talk about some of the challenges that we all face together. My first takeaway from this meeting is that we still have the opportunity to work together and to tackle some of the problems that we all together as humans face. And my second takeaway is that we all share the same pain as humanity. What we need to think about right now is, do we have the needs? Do we have the tools? to tackle these problems together. And I think the answer is, and I'm going to focus more on the digital part, not the technology, but the digital transformation, which defines us setting a new vision. So the first thing I'd like to recommend, with my takeaway, is that we all need to work together to define a vision for ourselves, which could be a better world, which could be a safer world, which could be a united world for ourselves, for our children, and for our children and children. Once we set that vision, then we need to work together to see how we can achieve that vision. And of course we need to set the goals. Because without a clear vision and without defining goals, I think that we're going to continue to discuss. But we will never ever reach the vision. So I believe that that vision exists. The best way to do to reach that vision is to transform the way we think, to transform the way we do things. 
and technology can play a major role there. And of course, when you talk about technology, it's not only technology, it's the digital transformation, where 70% of it is people and leadership and management and human being, whether those are people who accept the change and the way we do things, or people who do them in the project. So 20% is technology and 10% is algorithms. So let's connect, let's communicate. Let's work together to build those platforms that can help us connect to each other faster, that can help us to use the data, to share the data in a responsible way, to impact the decision making in our governments, to communicate to each other for our own future, and to make sure that we're not left out of the decision making, and to make sure that we get the right data in the right time. So digital transformation can play a major role, and I see this room full of uh, both political as well as business leaders that can work together to make that happen. My recommendation for Gaziantep specifically would be to become a digital leader, to not only digitalize their own government services, to not only create the right ecosystem for ICT investments, but also trying to in, uh, create that ecosystem that helps them uh, develop our ICT industry they can become the leader and they can become that city that can create solutions for other cities as well as for other countries. I see that talent here, I see that willingness, and I think as they are reconstructing, they can invest in digital skills, in digital infrastructure, as well as create a vision of their own, create a team of their own, and then become the number one city in Turkey for providing, not only being the digital government uh, province, but also providing digital services to others. And next, we'll hear from Murat, a site in that preserve, chairman of the Integral Group of companies encompassing Switzerland, Great Britain, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, and the stands, and I won't name them all, uh, which include one of the largest exporters and logistics providers for crude oil and petroleum products from the Caspian region, as well as a trading and logistics company specializing in non-oil commodities. So you're covering the whole spectrum there, aren't you? What are, what, is, what are some takeaways that you would like to share with us about? Great. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy that we're all here together in the beautiful city of Gaziantep, uh, despite the COVID, and this is the first for us a global meeting after COVID pandemic, and uh, Frank and his team did really heroic efforts to do this, uh, and uh, I'm very grateful. And, uh, now we are back, the Russian community is back, for us this global meeting is back, and now we are all together to unite our efforts and forces uh, to do something good for this uh, world. And uh, uh, just one small comment, here I was introduced as a businessman, but I'm here mainly as the president of the Great Caspian Association, uh, this as association for promotion and development of the Great Caspian region. And uh, Turkey is an uh, integral part of this region. That's why we also look at it like this. Uh, now, uh, the takeaways. Uh, we had uh, more than 50 sessions, and uh, I participated uh, in some of them, because it was impossible, unfortunately, to cover physically even all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, the main thing, uh, the main idea is everything is possible in this world, and all together we can do a lot of things, uh, which we cannot do alone. And, uh, uh, and uh, all of us would like to make this world better, and uh, there are a lot of ways, and somebody trying to do this through the business, which is very good. Somebody trying you know, to do this via digitalization, also great. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, what was not discussed uh, the, really deeply, the, uh, unfortunately, is geopolitics. Because uh, uh, today we have the situation that there are two conflicts uh, which would really ruin our world. And then, uh, we should concentrate, all of us, even the business community. I understand that uh, it's probably mainly the task of international organizations, but unfortunately, these organizations are not showing uh, the proper performance. And uh, there are good initiatives from the, uh, from the side of Turkey. Uh, we saw the peacemaking efforts uh, from the president of Turkey, also the grain corridor, grain deal, uh, which is very important for the food security of the world. 
but I think uh, everybody, even from the Horasis community, and Horasis community became enough strong to give the recommendations for the business community, but also for the government, for the various countries, uh, represented here more than 50 countries. And uh, uh, first priority, in my view, it should be to solve these two geopolitical problems. Uh, and without this, uh, and these problems, if we will not solve them now, they will deteriorate and we will have in very short term perspectives a huge, uh, huge destruction of this world. And then, uh, it's very important, the climate change issues, ESG, digitalization, but in my view, this is the second priority for the world. Uh, now, uh, we've heard a very inspiring speech of Minister Shinshek about the uh, Turkey, the today's situation, and uh, I'm happy that there is a clear plan how to develop the economy. And uh, after this uh, speech, I was really thinking, okay, what I can do in Turkey, how I can invest in Turkey. Uh, this, is really, uh, this is a really good news. And uh, uh, Turkey, now the geopolitical level, and uh, uh, has a very strong presence and very strong impact. Uh, and now just a uh, little bit deep to develop the economy, I think it's possible, perfectly doable. Uh, now, uh, recommendations. Uh, I've met here several really brilliant young people in the Horasis community the first time. And then I think that uh, we need to create, uh, I will not say young global leader, I would rather say future global leader, leaders community inside Horasis, and some people are here in the room. Uh, and we should help these people uh, who, who, who would be really the uh, best of the best politicians in their countries, or best business leaders, uh, to develop what they can develop. Uh, uh, this is one. And second recommendation is, uh, I believe we need to create inside for us the permanent think tank. Uh, because a lot of ideas were, were discussed, a lot of solutions were proposed, uh, but now we need uh, to do systematization of this. And then, of course, it's very difficult to do during the one or two days uh, events. No matter it's for us, it's global, in the Asia, or any other event. That's why I think there should be at least a small group of, uh, from for us, community who, who should permanently do this uh, day to day. And then, on the, each uh, next meeting, to uh, provide and produce the results. We were discussing several times with uh, Frank about the, doing the declarations. Uh, which is good. Uh, I think this also we need to implement regularly, but think time probably will be the good possibility. And then uh, all the local sessions are on the chat and control. Uh, maybe not here, but on other events. Uh, but uh, uh, results of the uh, documents from think time should be accessible to everyone. And uh, uh, I will probably also later on give you some very nice story about how business and the charity organizations could solve not the geopolitical but regional problems. Uh, but uh, what I believe, uh, everything is possible in this world, and let's join together our, our forces to identify the problems and try to solve them. Starting from geopolitics and going to the economy, uh, going to the logistics, going to digitalization, all, all part of our activity. Thank you. Thank you, Marat. It's true, when you think about all the brain power that we have in Horasis, in terms of knowledge, experience, cultural, we should really be leveraging that in a think tank format. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a special guest, um, Emra Edmir, who is an expert in new construction building. Uh, your, uh, your executive director general at Blue Bank. So why don't you share some of your thoughts on new construction and recommendations? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to deliver my special thanks to Her Excellency Ms. Fatma Shani uh, and Mr. Frank uh, for what a nice summit that we can have advantage and opportunities to make impact on our community in Gaza. It's very important. The topic is impact and now we are making impact on our community. What do we do together? Actually, Inbank is a national construction and development bank and only responsible for serving to local authorities and municipalities. We are a affiliated institution of Ministry of Environment, so if we are talking about sustainable urban development, we are at the center 
and has impact where the breach between international institutions and the local authorities. Actually, <coughs> we faced a very devastating earthquake, actually all of you know. And after the earthquake, we are talking how we reconstruct these things. But this kind of summits like Horizons and Horizons Committee can achieve one thing. We can do everything <coughs> before earthquakes. We are responsible for risk mitigation, not adaptation. After earthquake, it's very easy. You can find finance and you can easily reconstruct cities, buildings, and provide accommodation for host <coughs> But before earthquake, we have to do something. Not earthquake, we face a lot of disasters. Actually, after the pandemic, maybe uh, there are some advantages of this pandemic, COVID-19. Before pandemic, we think that all problems anywhere in the world, uh, they are real problems. They have to solve that. But after pandemic, we realized that, like climate change, like this kind of pandemics and disasters, we have to combat all together or in order to overcome this kind of problems. If we decrease the carbon emissions in Turkey, this doesn't make any sense to all world. All countries have to do this. This is very important. All panelists emphasize the importance of working together. Really, it's very important that all world human beings, they have to work together and transfer our knowledge to each other. As Ilbank, what we will do shortly in earthquake area, we have some item topics very famous in recent years, actually, combating climate change, disaster risk management, sustainable development drug, course, drug. A lot of politicians say a lot of topics, but we think that do these talkings by politicians make impact on host communities? We face a lot of problems, so the answer is no. So we have to do different things to make impact on communities to overcome these problems. Yes, as Ilbank, together with municipalities in this region, we'll start, uh, we have already started, but we'll continue next year uh, to reconstruct environmental infrastructure, urban projects, and uh, housing projects for our citizens of communities. When I first hear about Horizon Committee that takes place in Gazante, first I surprised. Secondly, what a nice summit that in an earthquake area and in a, this kind of conference center, we feel very uh, confident and we uh, develop our speakings. This means we can create, we can create re resilient buildings, resilient place, and uh, this is a good sample and we can organize a meeting summits uh, all together. As in bank, financing the municipalities or finding any uh, finance from outside from World Bank or any other international financing institutions is a work duty that we have to do. But the most important thing to transfer knowledge know-how and the best practice all over the world. This is very important. That's why we have to work together. Uh, this is impact and we create all together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Very So now I would like to have the panelists share some stories. They have some fascinating stories uh, from their experience about reconstruction, rebuilding, that I hope will inspire you and give you ideas for the possibility in your own situation. So, Regine, let's go back to you. Uh, as you've mentioned, you're a great proponent of steward leadership. Uh, so, why is it so relevant to the challenges we face in reconstruction, sustainability? And do you have a story that kind of illustrates its power? 
Sure. So why is steward leadership important? Again, steward leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for stakeholders, society, future generations, and the environment, not just for the shareholder. Right? So why is it important? Because if you ask yourself, what is the biggest lesson that COVID-19 taught us? It is that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Right? So this world today that we live in is hugely interconnected and interdependent. And as every panelist and every session has emphasized in this conference, we need to work together to defeat today's existential challenges. That is why the idea of creating a collective better future. That's why we need steward leadership. Now, steward leadership involves playing with, uh, leading your life, your business, your government work, whatever it is, with four values. Interdependence. The belief that the more I help the world, the more the world will help me, the more I give, the more I give. Long-term view, taking a long-term view. There may be some short-term costs, but in the long-term, if I think long-term, we are going to be successful. Ownership mentality, taking ownership for today's problems. We will solve them, I will solve them. And finally, creative resilience, which is innovation, innovation, innovation, and never giving up until you find the image. So those are the four values. Now, a story of steward leadership. One of many stories, but I'll share one. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, a sprawling uh, acres and acres of hilly uh, mountains with a lush green forest. 30 years ago, this place called the Golden Triangle, which is the border, which is the uh, border of Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand, was lush green hills, beautiful forests. Uh, but then, uh, independent militia, heavily armed independent militia took over and they destroyed the forest and it became scorched earth. Uh, they were armed, they were not controlled by any government, so the only thing they wanted to do was grow opium and run prostitution business. So now this one slush green forest area of the villages around this golden triangle is now a haven for opium and drug production and is a haven for prostitution. There is no other profession. There are no schools nearby, there are no hospitals nearby, so if you fall sick, the only medicine is opium, so it's also giving you huge amounts of addiction issues, right? If you wanted to make a living, your only choice was getting to the drug trade or getting to prostitution. Life was horrible beyond imagination. 30 years ago, one, one day, the Thai princess mother arrived. She looked, she came in the truck by the chopper, on top of one of the hills and said to her team, uh, no, this cannot be it. We need to reimagine a different future for this place. And she challenged her team to change the face of this place. Today, if you go to the Golden Triangle, you will find that the Scotch earth is reforested again. Beautiful lush green forest on the way. No more opium production, no more prostitution. And the same impoverished villagers who were uh, subdued and beaten up to those things are owners of five very successful community-owned businesses. They produce excellent single-origin coffee, they produce excellent macadamia nuts, they produce garments, they produce fabrics, and tourism. In fact, their product, products are sold in brands like IKEA, Muji, and many other international chains. They employ the best Italian designers to design the, the, the garments. In many airports, airports you can see the shops, they're called Doitung. So the region is called the Doitung region. And what I'm describing is the Doitung development project. Excellent, excellent story of collective good. And these are community-owned businesses, hugely profitable. So the idea here is that you have to find profitable solutions to today's challenges. It's an amazing story. If anybody hasn't been there, I urge you to go there for a tourist trip. In fact, they are also, by the way, a sixth thing. They are now a living laboratory of circular economy. They, they run, uh, uh, you go there and you will learn uh, what circular economy is all about. We think of recycling in terms of three or four different bins. They recycle at 37 points. They are teaching the whole world what sustainability is, what circular economy is, besides having created five hugely profitable community owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So that would be the story I would share, and I would agree with you that you know, lead together. If we join hands and if we imagine a collective better future, we humans can do amazing things, but we have to get over narrow self-interest. 
We have to get over conflict and get into real collaboration. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point, isn't it? Getting over that narrow self-interest, because no one person could have accomplished that by themselves. It was really a group effort. Thank you for that story. Um, Murat, we'll come back to you in a minute. But uh, Fahim, why don't you share with us, uh, as the Minister uh, for Telecom, Telecom, excuse me, Telecommunication and Information Technology, you were given an ambitious mandate also to spearhead digital transformation in Afghanistan. And it wasn't just about upgrading the legacy infrastructure, right? It would be pretty easy just to go in and change the technology. But you also had to deal with changing mindsets and people's behaviors and, and attitudes towards change. Can you give us a sense of where you started and where you ended up? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, when I was uh, first uh, appointed as the minister, I did not have IT background. And one of the reasons they brought me in was because I did not understand IT. Uh, because the previous ministers focused only on algorithms, technology, computers, and equipment. And the problem was not with computers, because computers are always created in a good quality, in a, in a good way, and computers can function if you have the right people using them and if you use them the right way. So the first thing I needed to do was to uh, define a vision. What is trans digital transformation? Why do we need digital transformation? When I'm saying digital transformation, I'm not talking about IT. I'm not talking about digital infrastructure only. I'm talking about why are we not performing well? Why are we not able to reduce corruption? Why are we not able to provide services to the uh, citizens of this country? Why are we not able to reuse that data in a responsible way? Why are we not effective? Why are we not working together? Why are we fighting over an election for one or two years? Why can we not ensure transparency? I mean, there were so many problems that, that I could miss. And then I spoke to the president, and he said, I'm, I'm bringing you in to uh, reform this sector. I said, I'm not going to reform the sector. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vision for better governance. And I'm going to create a vision for an information society. And unless we have an information society and knowledge-based economy and a digital government, you cannot do anything in any ministry. So that effort included every ministry, not just my own ministry. For instance, e-medicine. E for instance, e hajj or, um, or digital ID that, that we had to uh, create and people were then registered and they finally had their identities registered. Or uh, the first, uh, for the first time we were able to create digital uh, uh, driving license. And all of these things happened in just a matter of maybe a year and a half. So it was a very high speed decision. But the first thing I did was I created this vision. And then I created the national digital agenda. And that's exactly what we need to do here. We need a global agenda for a future, uh, a better future. And then after that, I went and spoke to the president. And this is the, be this is the most important part. You need digital vision to be supported by the digital leaders. And if you do not have the leader's support, then you're not going to be able to move politically and economically. When I got this support, then I was able to create the relevant strategies and everything else, and we started, you know, digitalizing a lot of government services. Um, we reduced the corruption um, a lot. Of course, it was not totally eliminated, but wherever we implemented digitalization and digital transformation, the corruption reduced. The coordination got much better. For the first time after 15 years, I was able to pass the e-signature and e-transaction law for the first time in the country after um, 15 years of work. In 2018, we were able to pass the law. Uh, so that emails were officialized and you could actually email and that could work as a contract. Uh, but more importantly, coordination increased. And we were able to register people. We were able to identify two, three hundred thousand, uh, you know, um, um, government employees that did not exist actually. So we saved a lot of money, we saved a lot of things. Now, the reason I'm saying this uh, is that unless we define a vision, unless we define a strategy, unless we def redefine the way we do things, I think, and use the tools that we have at our hands, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve any goal. The last thing I would like to mention is that um, we created the right ecosystem. Of course, Afghanistan is not in the, in, in, in the best condition right now, but even the current government is using those. We attracted a lot of investment into um, a country like Afghanistan because the investors were confident that we could actually um, uh, protect their investment. So um, the, the, the last thing that, that I was going to say was we created the right um, team, and that's the key thing. You know, just like uh, Rod was saying, we need these structures, um, these agile, bionic 
flat structures where we can communicate with each other faster. We have the first ministry ever created in a government that uh, where we have accepted a bionic and a flat structure. In a typical government, if you go down, you have 15, 20 different layers. But in our, in our ministries, we only have four different layers. The ministers, the deputy, and the directors, we have digital officers, we have chief digital officers, we have CIOs, and then team, uh, uh, teams of five or ten experts. So the layers were not that much, and we could do that by changing the legislation and created a, a digital ministry. Now, what I'm thinking for Brazil said is that since they're very committed, they could have their own digital office, they could have their own digital leader, they could have their own digital officers, through which they will then be able to use technology to create an environment for investment, an ecosystem for investment, to prevent, the earth, not, not to prevent, but at least uh, be aware of all of the natural disasters and stuff that they could uh, anticipate. Anyways, I'm not going to be very detailed, but in a country like Afghanistan, we were able to achieve so much by using digital technologies, by accepting the fact that we had to change the way the way we did. And had we started this earlier, we would have not been in a mess that we are today because hundreds of billions of dollars were wasted because the information was not accessible. People were working in silos. There were no transparency, no efficiency. Had we done this earlier, we would have been much ahead of where we are right now, but I'm glad we still did it. And that was an experience that you know proved that technology can really help uh, become efficient, more effective, and work towards a better and a united future. Thank you for that. I think that is an example, you know, when you take technology to a place that's already fairly developed, it's less impressive to see their progress. But when you take it to somewhere, I think you told me there were 22 million people now out of the 34 million population that now have access to internet, that may not have had it before. So that is an exponential value there that you created. Well, absolutely. The best thing you could do was to... Um, um, to invest in accessible and affordable internet. And that's why during COVID we were able to uh, provide free education to um, all of the Afghans around the country. And of course, thanks to Telcos, we used their technology called Mixa, the, the internet traffic, where um, people were able to download the, the teaching material for free. Even now that the girls are not allowed to go to school, they're still able to use that system and download educational material wherever they are. When you inform people, when you give people access to internet, they can then access the information they would, they would like to read. They will then access the information that they can use to make decisions about their own lives. And um, we were also able to digital uh, to develop digital economy. I mean, not only digitalize our own economy, of course it's not a, in a very large scale, but we were able to, by creating demand in the market, by creating more service, digital services, we were able to reduce the internet costs almost um, from, from $5 per uh, GB to 30 cents per GB in a matter of just two or three years. The internet costs came down radically because more people started using it. The competition grew. So I think the more demand you create, the more you use internet and digital services, the more competitive the prices will become, the more people will be involved and engaged and informed. Internet now is like oxygen. But anyways, the internet was an issue there, it's not here. Uh, the bottom line is, Digitalization, digital transformation is not about technology. Let's use technology to connect better, to stay connected, to stay informed, to make better decisions uh, for the future, and it could be used for anything. So that, my, my example wasn't totally the best example of the world, but we did a lot in a country like Afghanistan. We had all people you know, watching um, content on his iPhone um, uh, when, um, you know, after so many years, and making decisions and reporting after uh, so many disastrous years uh, in, in that country. And I believe that was an achievement. Thank you. Oh, it's definitely an achievement. Uh, so now let's go to the other side of the world, maybe the, another extreme, to California, Silicon Valley, with maybe the most tech savvy people in the world. Uh, Catherine, so you were mayor of uh, Menlo Park during a decade of exponential change in the world and in the, in the US in particular with mobile technology, with social media, civil unrest, climate change. So maybe you can share a specific story, an accomplishment that um, maybe represents reconstruction possibility, something you're proud of during that period. Sure. Um, I think one of the key things to point out is, as Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum talks about the fact that we're now in the fourth industrial revolution. And I don't know how many of you have heard that or know what it is. It's basically saying we're moving out of the age of data and into the age of systems. 
And it's all like clockwork. If you move one area, it has knock-on effects in the other areas now as well. The, the whole butterfly effect thing is, is a reality of what we were talking earlier. We now, we now have 8 billion butterflies. And keeping track of that is tremendous. And one of the key things in this is, as we talk about trust, there, there are three aspects of trust. There's the trust in businesses, and we know that businesses in the higher quartiles of trust have half the turnover, they're more profitable, they're more stable. And then the, on the personal level, people working in businesses that have higher levels of trust, those people uh, are psychologically happier. That spills into their, uh, people that say they're happy at work actually then report that they're happier in their marriage and with their family. And that factors into health. If you're working in a higher trust environment, you actually have a better chance of surviving cancer, having uh, better ability to manage uh, diseases such as diabetes and uh, heart disease. It has a huge effect that then spills over into communities. Communities at higher levels of trust, uh, people report being happier with the standard of living, but it goes all the way up to uh, the country level. Countries, for every standard deviation of trust that a country goes up, on average, the SME gets $2.3 million in investment more. So the trust in the individual, the trust in uh, the corporations, the trust in the communities all impact each other. And it's very difficult sometimes uh, to get those communication going that we're talking about because I don't think industry fully appreciates the amount of pressure, the different types of pressures that politicians have, for example. And that's completely different in academia, because trust me, from what I've seen, academia is its own level of politics as well. And one of the interesting examples of that coming together is um, we as mayors in Silicon Valley, you, you think that we know a lot about tech, but you know, a lot of us are, are lawyers and come from different backgrounds, and nobody likes to admit what you don't really understand. We were voting on uh, 3rd G tech, uh, 5G technology, and I realized a lot of people didn't know. So we had a closed session, Chatham House rules. We get all the experts in, and maybe some Stanford people, and talk about, you can ask all the embarrassing questions so that you really begin to understand this technology. And people love that. They love that safety of have, not being able to be quoted and, and really being able to understand better the technology behind some of the decisions that they were having to make. And they liked it so much, we had a couple more. And then David Pine, who's a county board supervisor for San Mateo, uh, knew about electricity. And so I said, David, you know, would you like to sponsor some? That worked out so well that we learned about community choice aggregators. And I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, PG&E is our electric company that seems to be uh, bent on burning down California, and not terribly popular. So we found out that we could actually fire them and create our own electric company, which we did, Peninsula Clean Energy. And it all started with us learning about what the technology was available for clean energy. And we got a big round table and we had advocates, we had academics, we had people from corporations, and we had elected officials all sitting around as equals, learning and bringing in experts and finding out, could we actually do this? Is there enough energy for us to buy? The end result, long story short, Peninsula Clean Energy now provides 100% greenhouse gas for electricity to over a million people in Silicon Valley at 5% less than what pg e charges, showing that you don't have to pay more to do what's good for the society, good for the world. And because we're not paying the, the high salaries, we were actually making an embarrassing amount of, of profits on top of this. So then we started programs where we were giving electric bikes away to students that had been pre-qualified for free reduced price lunch. So we knew that they, they needed that help. Um, being able to help people make the right choices for greening their house for their, for their uh, kitchen upgrades that were more sustainable. So that it became cyclical in terms of doing what was right for the community uh, on, on the green level. And uh, all of this came from us having the safe space to be able to learn and talk about what was actually happening and what was actually capable of happening. So remember, um, sometimes you can't have the uncomfortable conversations learning publicly. Sometimes you have to meet privately. 
There are all kinds of ways that you can get together to do it, but it is critical to have the conversations and get to know each other and build those relationships where you can learn from each other and bounce ideas and create new things like Peninsula Clean Energy, which has been a huge success. And we, I'm proud to say it's been a model now for San Francisco doing the same, and San Jose, and other counties around California. Thank you for that, Catherine. It's true that, um, I don't know if there's studies around it, but um, most people, when they go to work, they have two jobs. One is doing their job, and one is, is making sure that people don't find out you know, their mistakes and what they don't know, and they don't feel safe often to ask questions. So I love that when you give them a, a safe space, you create this virtuous circle, cycle, that just kept generating more solutions. Wonderful. Um, let's come back to you now, Marat. Marat, you have a, an amazing story about how business uh, can be a force for good. Could you share that story? Yes, I will tell you one interesting story which recently happened in our region uh, where business together with the charity organizations solved the regional issues which uh, no international organization, no governments of the countries were able to solve. And uh, I'm talking about the Central Asia. We know that Central Asia is a landlocked region and uh, it's very difficult uh, to move uh, various cargoes from the region to the world market and from the world market to the region. And, uh, there are several transit routes which are going from the region. Uh, one which was traditionally used was going via Russia, then uh, was started between Russia and Ukraine, and suddenly it became very problematic because of sanctions, banks, and the regulations, and also not very safe. Uh, of course, uh, businessmen they started to move cargo through the other illegal route, which was Azerbaijan, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, so called East West Corridor. <coughs> Immediately this route became congested, uh, a lot of bottlenecks. Uh, big delays, up to several months delays to move your cargo, and uh, which became completely unsustainable. And then uh, there is another route which is going through Iran, also sanctions, also problems, regulations, and so on. And then uh, people re recalled about the fourth route, which is going through Afghanistan. And uh, in Afghanistan, just before uh, in September 21, uh, there was a change of uh, government. And then a new, a new people came, the Taliban regime, uh, which was uh, not internationally recognized. And then uh, for the world community, Afghanistan became the black hole, the territory nobody would like to touch. In reality, Afghanistan, like a country, like ge geographically, is not sanctioned. The problem is that only if you are dealing with the urban people in the new regime. And then uh, this was a good opportunity, and of course, business people started to think why not to move cargo to Afghanistan, to the nice ports in Pakistan, or the Karachi ports, deep sea ports with access to the Indian Ocean and then worldwide. Uh, the question was how to do this, because no, nobody would like at that time at least to go to Afghanistan and discuss with the new regime about some business and so on. And then, uh, there is a charity foundation in Zurich called the Eurasia Card Foundation. They are, they are doing cardiac surgery for children free of charge in our region, Greater Caspian region, and they were invited together with Red Cross to go and to do surgery in Kabul in Afghanistan. They came there, uh, they were provided with a hospital, they started to do surgery uh, for the children. Uh, very soon there was a queue of 60,000 children for the cardiac surgery in Afghanistan. Today this queue is 200,000 children. And uh, the problem of this, if uh, you will not do in time these operations for the child, the child could just die or could not develop properly. Uh, and uh, uh, then the so-called Minister of Health of the new regime, they thought, okay, what we can do for you? Uh, how we can expand these operations? Because uh, one mission, they could do like 50 to 100 operations, they cannot do 1,000, they cannot do 10,000. And the question was uh, how to do this, uh, how to scale it. Uh, and then uh, these doctors uh, contacted us and asked what, how, what we should reply. And we told them, as uh, our association members, okay, ask from the Taliban regime, can they provide the security of transit of the cargoes from the region? And uh, for, the, uh, for, for the government, uh, for Afghanistan, it was just, they just doing nothing, anyhow security is there. In Afghanistan is now a very secure country. Uh, like you can really cross the country and not touch uh, you. Before, uh, like three, four years ago, there were more than 20 different groups 
and uh, military commanders and uh, tribes, and you should deal with all of them. No, you just deal with only with one, uh, with one person in the, in the, in the government. Uh, and, uh, and suddenly they started working. Uh, and now, just we need to scale this as much as possible, because of 200,000 children in the queue, the self cost of one operation in Afghanistan through this uh, scheme is $1,000. One life, $1,000. To do this surgery in somewhere in Switzerland will cost you hundred thousand dollars plus logistics, it's hundred hundred times more. And uh, and this is uh, and then slowly, slowly this uh, scheme started to work and start uh, started to scale. And then what I'm saying here that uh, and before that there was a United Nations, other United Nations agency. They tried to solve this issue without success. Uh, then there were governments of the region like Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, they also need Afghanistan in the transit country. They tried but didn't work. And suddenly they saw, because of their force, again the professors of medicine, the surgeons, because of some business people, uh, and because of uh, kind of goodwill of the government of the existing government of Afghanistan. And what I'm trying to say is that you see everything is possible. And uh, let's try to find such problems and try to solve them using what we have in our hands. And, uh, and for us, this, as an organization, is a really great, uh, uh, bringing really great opportunities. We have more than several thousand people in the Horasis community, Horasis network, various government officials, international organizations, with some people here. Uh, we have businessmen. We have uh, university professors. Uh, we have even medical doctors. I met with one professor. He is also doing free of charge surgery in the region. And now I'm going to invite him into do this in Afghanistan. And uh, let's try to formulate and uh, uh, identify the problems and try, uh, let's try to solve them together. This is my message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So if that story doesn't illustrate what's possible, I don't know what story will. I mean, would you want to be the one going to the Taliban to negotiate safe passage? But I think it was the Swiss surgeons themselves who went to negotiate and they were so driven, they had such a clear vision that I think it must have overridden the, any fear they might have had. Yes, and their goal and their task was to scale the, the, the operations because they, they saw the children. They wanted to save and lives. They wanted to help. And how to help, of course, everybody has limited budgets. Everything is very difficult. And here there is a unique possibility. Solving logistic connectivity problem of the region, saving children's lives, at the same time, uh, if transit will start going, uh, there will be a lot of jobs created in Afghanistan yeah. for the truck drivers, or for the people, who, for the transshipments, and so on. And, so on. and uh, without, let's say, paying money to the relevant people to understand this and so on in, in, in the government. And, uh, and then, uh, when I'm saying this story to, on the various uh, on the various meetings, and uh, people just want to believe it, how it's possible, mm -hmm. but this was perfectly possible. Let's do this together in some other places of the world. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good place to pause. I want to thank all of the panelists for your contributions, your thoughts, your thinking. And I thought I would end with a quick quote from Fatih Sultan Mehmet, who was a sultan in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he was one that reconquered Istanbul. He said, it's necessary to try the impossible to see the limitations of the possibility. And I think all of your stories have really illustrated how far we can take possibility. So thank you, and thank you to the audience. Thank you very much, and I'm so, much I'm so sorry that I have forgotten to announce your name. I'm sure all of our participants know him very well, but I just want to uh, repeat it. One of our, of course, uh, panelists was uh, Fahim Hashimi. He is the president of Hashimi Group and former Minister of Communication and Information Technology of Afghanistan. And with this discussion, thank you very much. We have come to the end of our panels uh, of Horace's uh, global meetings. Thank you very much. I am looking for Frank, actually, uh, who has brought us together for this significant organization. And the floor is yours. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. For a wonderful panel, and thanks to Nita for, for sharing it. A lot of inspiration. And I think that you mentioned all your stories and all the narratives. We have to work together. We have to join hands. And also give up our selfish behavior. I think we have to work in the global public interest. 
uh, and it's, I think, what we all said. Uh, it's a great summary, really, uh, all of you. So big applause to you, all of you panelists. Just a quick um, housekeeping announcement. The buses are waiting outside, bringing us to the dinner location. But before we go, we'd like to invite everybody to come to the stage for a photo, for a family photo. So please join us on the stage with the panelists. Bekliyoruz zaten daha hızlı banıyorlar. Pardon, sorry. Oh. Şey biraz sağ tarafa alabilir miyiz ya? Kim söyleyecek? A little bit come to right, please. Abi şey sol taraftan sağ tarafa alabilirsek çok iyi olur. Tam ortalı olsun diye. Yoksa bu tarafa çok saçma. Şey, mağdur. Thank you. 